picking a show, talking about young producers, yeah. how do you, when you go to see a show at Passamorai or you see a sh show in Chicago or Australia, how do you choose with your head? Do you choose with your wallet? Do you choose with your heart? How do you well, say? You choose first with your heart, and then you figure out that you can't afford to do it. <laughs> <laughs> and then? And then you try and figure out, is there a way you could afford to do it? And sometimes the answer is yes, and sometimes it's no. So I love to go to the cartoucherie, uh, the Théâtre uh, uh, du Soleil uh, in Paris, because Ariane Manushkin creates a spectacle. And I've gone and I've seen the unfortunate and unfinished history of Prince Sihanouk of Cambodia, which he does over eight hours in two four-hour segments and serves Cambodian, you know, Cambodian meals in between at large tables with other foreigners sitting with me, watching this spectacle based on a Shaw Cross book. And this is not coming to the Princess of Wales? Not next week. <laughs> <laughs> I love the six hours of Mahabharata that, uh, you know, that uh, Peter Brook did in, in London, but I loved it, or in Paris at the uh, Bouffe du Nord, but I loved it mostly because my French isn't good enough to fully understand it. When I went to see it in Brooklyn, and it was translated into English, I found it much less poetic. And while I was sitting watching it in French, and I had an English actor next to me, and I was in Paris, I said, this isn't French now, is it? He said, no, David, we've moved to Sanskrit. Right. And I thought, oh, OK, I get it. Yeah. So when your heart says yes to a piece, yes. and then your business sense so says, I'll probably lose money, but how can I work this? How do you learn that reflex that takes your heart and then says, how do I work that against the books? Well, the, the production of, of works, there you know, there's set parameters. We know the rent is so much, the advertising is so much, uh, the cast, you know, we, we know our costs. And then you say, is there any hope in hell that I'll sell the tickets? We did a production in the old Vic of Candide. Uh, we won the Olivier Award that year for Best Musical. Um, we did 100% business, which was 106,000 pounds a week. And it took 116,000 pounds a week to run it. So you knew that the longer you ran, you'd lose 10,000 every week. So we ran for six weeks because we couldn't afford to lose any more money. Uh, so you know, those are the, the things that sometimes you do it knowing you can't win. And the option to put up the ticket price to cover that loss was Wasn't strong enough, too delicate a piece. We were already at the ultimate and we thought of what we could charge. So you know, th there are limits as to what you can do. We know, knew that uh, August Osage County, which had won the Pulitzer Prize, uh, was a show that was worthy of putting on. We also knew that every Pulitzer Prize winning play always loses money. <laughs> so we had two givens, <laughs> okay? <laughs> okay, we're talking about the principles of production. Yeah. One of the principles is every Pulitzer Prize, prize winning play has never will made lose money. money. That's right. Okay, so, right. Now, so now you've got some inside theater information <laughs> up front. All right. Okay? And it's a very big cast play. And uh, we knew that to put it on subscription, we would offend a core group of our audience because my audience will tolerate the F word, but it really has a distaste for the C word. Right. Uh, at Tarragon, I had a talk once with Mallory Gilbert, and she said to me, my audience will tolerate the C word, but they won't tolerate live cigarette smoke from the stage. So each of us has challenges, <laughs> okay? Right. We have different challenges. Uh, so how do you put this play on to minimize your loss? So we did as an extra to the subscription. We did it uh, in a fairly large house, so we had a lot of seats so we could keep the prices very low. We did only 13 performances, and we probably lost $125,000 but we thought it was worth putting into the season as an extra. We were having a good season, and we weren't losing shareholders' money, we were losing mine. Right. So I thought in terms of overall what we're doing, long term, we have to do dramas. 
and we have to do tough ones. And this way I wasn't offending subscribers, everyone came warned. Right. Uh, but it was a great play and it was great acting. It was a great show and I had a lot of pleasure out of it. You and know, David you chose to subsidize an art that he was passionate yeah, about. Yeah, now if I had taken that same money and put my, uh, as a donation to some building or to a theater company, I would have had ten times the recognition because that amount of money would make a big difference mm -hmm. to a place like Soul Pepper. Mm -hmm. But there are people who do that and I do something else in the community. So it's a, it's a choice. Uh, and the same held true for Cloud Nine. I had an enormous affection for Cloud Nine. I had seen Bill Glasgow's production and that's where I went to find a team of people to be line producers that's for right. me to Brian learn how Sewell. to run this place. And it ended up that Brian Sewell runs Mervish Productions and that's how I found him. So Cloud Nine was important to me. And I had done it with Sir Peter, Peter Hall in England and I thought it was a very good production but I thought that Bill's was better. And so I wanted to relive that and I had a, uh, a young director who I had faith in who I wanted to have do something. And so you know, I decided I was going to do Cloud Nine. Um, I knew up front that it's a tough one to make a, a go of and I knew we'd lose money probably. Uh, but we had great actors in it. It was a great production. Uh, I think the theater community did come out to see it. So the actors saw the possibilities of what's out there and I think enjoyed the evening and we ran for the time we intended to and that was what we did. That's but what how, we do. How do you as a producer choose Sometimes the I choose ones that make money too. Yes, yes. <laughs> we, we will get to Mamma Mia. Okay. How, but how do you, there's the, again the young producing producer who wants to produce in Halifax. At the old Vic, you see the losses with Candide that you realize at a certain point you can't tolerate. You see the loss with Osage County that you can tolerate, or perhaps uh, with Cloud Nine. How do you, as a wise producer who has survived and still standing and thriving, how do you choose which loss you can take and which loss you can't? Well, d different situations create different you know, choices and experiences. And of course, this interview, what I'm saying, my father would highly disapprove of because he believed that when you were successful, you advertised it. And when you failed, and in commercial terms, failing means not making money, right. you don't advertise that or announce it. But if a young producer wants to know, um, the, I think that they should know that, that you have choices. Uh, you don't have the choice to lose until you win. Because if you don't have money to, win, to play with, to lose, then you can't afford to lose. So you shouldn't be doing what I'm doing till you're an old man. Or unless you make it fast, you can do it as a young man. Uh, or unless you make it somewhere else and you choose to do, it, do this, that's good too. Anybody that puts money into the theater, I'll applaud no matter how they put it in. Uh, but, you know, given that, um, what you choose to do when you lose has to do with your own sensibilities. Uh, I chose to lose on Cloud Nine because it resonated with all these memories I had and all these different reasons. Uh, I did not choose to lose in the Old Vic. I took over the Old Vic because I looked at my father's losses in the first eight years and I said, Dad, I can do better. And volunteering, as they say in the Army, is not always wise. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that's how I ended up in the theater business. One day, you know, my father ran the theaters for most of the time until 86. I looked at what was coming from Broadway and from uh, London and I said, you know, Dad, I don't like the shows very much and I think I could do better. And on top of that, I don't think we should be buying them all from the road. I think we can produce our own given the size of an audience we've got. And he said, is this a volunteer? And I said, I'd like to try. And that's how I ended up you know, running the Royal Alex. That was in 86. And then after eight years of running the Vic, I said, I think I can do better in the Vic. And I put up my hand and I took over the Vic. And that's when I put uh, uh, um, Jonathan Miller Jonathan in Miller. as my artistic director for three years. And although 
you know, I thought I could succeed financially. I thought I would at least break even. Uh, I didn't. You know, but it took, you know, I, I, I had Jonathan Miller for three years, I had Peter Hall for a very complicated and rich season of doing 13 plays in rep over 40 weeks. And you were critically successful, if I, if oh, I remember. Oh yes, all of these things were critically successful. 